it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. When I first started getting into horror as a teenager, one of the first films I saw that made me lock the door to my bedroom and huddle myself under the sheets all night <laughs> was John Carpenter's The Fog. Now, if you haven't seen this, it's a phenomenal film, set up magnificently by the opening scene, which is just some old sea dog sitting around a campfire, telling youngsters the tale of what happened to the town in which they all find themselves. You'll never see a better opening to a horror film. And that, in fact, is what inspired me to do these campfire tales. That scene. So, that's your homework for tonight. If you haven't seen the original John Carpenter's The Fog, check it out. One of the scariest things I've ever seen. So, on to tonight's story. Returning to one of my favourite authors, Michael Whitehouse. This is a classic old-school ghost story. It creeped me out a little bit while I was reading it, and I hope it's going to have the same effect on all of you. So, my dear friends, won't you join me around the campfire? So we are starting off tonight's collection of stories with a fantastic one called Someone Died in My Home, and I think they're still here. I've been reading creepy stories on No Sleep for three years, but I never thought I'd end up being in one. The last few months have been the strangest and most frightening of my life. Most of my friends think I've gone a bit mad, or I'm making it up. So where else was I supposed to vent but on this subreddit? It seems ridiculous typing this, but I'm sure my new flat is haunted. And believe me when I say, I wish it was all in my mind. It's not the most spacious of flats. I didn't buy it because I loved it, but it was all I could afford in an area close to work. The building isn't all that old, maybe 20 years or so, and the flat itself, which is three stories up, is quite modern inside, with wooden flooring and white walls. There are two bedrooms, one of which has been the focal point for everything that's occurred. When I moved in, I threw everything I couldn't find a place for into the second bedroom. I've never been the most organized, and I do tend to hoard things, if I'm honest. The spare room was filled with rolled up posters, tools, DVDs, boxes of clothes, and even some old bedroom furniture I still had left over from my last place. There wasn't much room to move around in there, so you can imagine my surprise when I heard something unthinkable coming from inside. It all started about two weeks after I moved in. I was cooking dinner in the kitchen one evening, and I'd zoned out while stirring some pasta, listening to a podcast, as I often do to get through the boredom of cooking. That was when I heard it. The boiling water faded into the background, as I realized that the sound of bubbles forming and bursting had been joined by a very distinct noise. I could hear the sound of footsteps walking slowly down the hall towards where I was. My nerves began to rattle. Someone had broken into my flat and was making their way to where I stood. I grabbed a kitchen knife. For those who think this is extreme, I have been burgled once before. I slowly made my way into the living room, and then towards the hall. Just as I reached the hall doorway, the footsteps sped up to running pace, followed by a door slamming violently. The hall was dark at first, as it has no windows, and as I entered it I felt like a child terrified of his own shadow, quickly reaching for the light. The front door lay at the end of the hallway, and I'd be lying if I didn't say that I thought about running to it and leaving the flat and any unseen intruder behind. My imagination started to run riot, as my mind played with the images of an attacker lurking behind one of the other three doors present. I nervously smiled to myself. I began to suspect that the footsteps had come from somewhere else, 
perhaps the flat above me. Still, I couldn't shake the unsettling feeling that I was not alone. First, I peeked nervously into the hall cupboard. Nothing there but bed sheets and towels. Then I checked my bedroom. The only crime being committed in there was the mess of the place. Finally, I stood in front of the door to the second bedroom. The spare room. Swinging it open, I let out a sigh of relief that the room was still filled with junk, but otherwise empty. At the time, I put it down to my imagination. But now, I know that it was the earliest indicator that something was wrong, that something was in the flat with me. I'd say about a week or so passed before anything happened again, and by then I'd put the footsteps out of my mind. It was a Sunday afternoon. I'd had a bad cold that week, and work had been difficult to get through. So I just stayed in the flat over the weekend, hoping I'd feel better by the morning. I was sitting on the living room couch, binge watching a TV show. The light was streaming through the windows, and my mind was as far away as possible from anything frightening or supernatural. Suddenly, and with no warning, someone walked into the living room behind me and marched straight through into the kitchen. I was startled and when I turned around I only caught the last few moments of the kitchen door being slammed shut with a bang. For some reason, my first reaction was to start shouting and swearing that I was going to cause whoever was in the kitchen real bodily harm. I wanted to frighten them away, but really it was I who was terrified. I ran into my bedroom and grabbed a golf club from my set which had been languishing in a cupboard since I'd moved in. As I wandered into the hall, the fear got the better of me. I unlocked the door, opened it, and ran into the hallway, which I share with the other residents, and then out into the street. After a minute or so, I was around the corner, out of sight, phoning the police. Thirty minutes later, the police arrived. I only entered the flat once they'd searched it thoroughly for the intruder. Nothing seemed to have been stolen, but the kitchen door had been shut as I thought. The police entered the room, but found no one, and told me that if someone had been in the flat, that they had already left. The kitchen itself was intact, but bizarrely, the intruder had turned on the lights, opened the oven, and left it running on a high heat. The police seemed satisfied that no one was there. And while they told me to phone the local police station if I saw anyone suspicious, it seemed clear to me that they thought I'd imagined the entire thing. I began to question myself, wondering if I'd left the oven on from the night before and forgotten about it, dosed up on cough medicine. The following night, I knew there was more than just my imagination at play. I tried to put the previous day out of my mind, but the sounds of footsteps and banging doors stayed with me. I've always thought the best remedy for a weary mind is sleep, so that's what I intended to do. I went through my nightly routine before going to bed. Front door locked. Check. Windows closed. Check. TV and other appliances switched off. Check. I shuffled off to bed, curled up and put the TV on so I had something to fall asleep to, the noise keeping me company and any paranoid thoughts at bay. Then, about five minutes later, I heard an unmistakable noise. A click. It was the light switch in the hall and was accompanied by light trickling underneath my door and into my room. I'm sure I must have taken in a sharp inhalation of air, but I remained silent, still and frozen. Someone was standing at my bedroom door. I could hear the floorboards creak under the weight. 
Before I had time to react, the intruder walked slowly down the hall away from my room. Stopped for a moment, and then I was sure of it. Entered the spare room. It took me a few seconds to piece together what had just happened. For a moment I hesitated again, wondering if I should phone the police or whether this was just another flight of fancy. Suddenly I heard a loud clattering noise, my things being thrown around violently. I called the police quickly and then frantically moved a wardrobe up against my bedroom door, hoping that I would be left alone. Then I heard the intruder again. A door creaked open quietly, almost inaudibly, and slowly, surely, the footsteps began walking towards my bedroom door. They then stopped right outside my room, as if the person were about to enter. That was the most terrifying thing. Having to wait to see what the intruder would do next, Suddenly, I heard a banging sound. The police were knocking on my outside door. The footsteps then turned, marched down the hall into the living room and then kitchen, before ending the entire ordeal abruptly with a loud bang of a slammed door. By the time I led the police into my flat, I was visibly shaken. And yet, they found very little at first. The kitchen was as it had been before, the oven door lying open, spewing out heat into the night. The spare room, however, was another story entirely. Everything in there had been violently thrown around, much of it broken and torn. An old mirror smashed, and most of the boxes and furniture upturned. I swore to the police that the intruder had never left that they couldn't have, and that May must still have been in the flat somewhere, hiding. But that suggestion was greeted with an unhealthy amount of incredulity. I won't bore you with the details, but these strange events continued for over two months. Sometimes it would be something small, a piece of furniture out of place, a light switching on by itself. But on three separate occasions, the same exact occurrences which had left me barricaded in my room took place. Footsteps in the hall, the spare room left in disarray, and then the slamming of the kitchen door and the oven lying open. Eventually, even on the quiet nights, the fear of something happening became too much for me. The anticipation took a heavy toll. Most nights nothing would occur. But then on others, the same ghostly footsteps would wander through my home. I just couldn't sleep there any longer. Finally, I couldn't bear it any longer, and so I spent several nights at my brother's, just to get a good night's sleep. I told him the truth, but he just seemed more worried about my state of mind than anything else. I don't blame him. I can imagine how it all must have appeared. After a few days, he offered a solution of sorts. He would house-sit with me. He wanted to see these occurrences for himself. I didn't enter back into the flat lightly, but if someone else experienced what I had, it would at least confirm to me that I wasn't going mad. I slept on an airbed on my bedroom floor, while my brother slept in my bed for three nights in a row, with nothing strange occurring. Then, finally, on the fourth night, as I was drifting off to sleep, I heard it. Click. The light in the hall came on. My brother sat up startled and looked down at me on the floor, his expression one of disbelief. He whispered for me to get up, which I did. We then Listen. The footsteps gradually appeared, as if starting from somewhere far off. They continued, growing louder as they walked slowly towards my bedroom door. 
I think that's the first time in my life when I've seen my brother genuinely scared. As the footsteps neared, he jumped out of bed and dragged my wardrobe in front of the door. It was then that he made himself quite clear, whispering in a low voice. He hadn't thought that anything would happen. In fact, he just came and stayed with me to set my nerves at ease, or to prove that I was sleepwalking and causing the issues myself. He didn't believe, but as the footsteps stopped outside the bedroom door, he swore under his breath and stood by the window. I think it was a natural reaction to look for a possible exit, but being three stories up, there wasn't anywhere to go. Then. It played out as before. The footsteps turned and walked away from us down the hall. They entered the spare room, which was followed by the noise of my things in there being thrown around. Finally, the footsteps walked to my door again, stood, and then marched down to the kitchen, slamming the door behind. Neither of us slept the rest of the night. And in the morning, my brother recommended that I leave the place behind and find a new home. <laughs> Easier said than done. As a condition of my mortgage, I couldn't sell the place until I'd officially been living there for two years. He offered for me to sleep at his until I could find somewhere else to rent in order to wait the two years out. But I just couldn't afford it. My brother and his wife had two kids and were trying for a third in a two-bedroom house. Staying there was no long-term solution for any of us. Later that day he phoned me, overly excited by the idea that he had found a solution. He had been doing some research online to see if other people had experienced similar strange goings-on in their homes, and what they had done, if anything, to stop them from happening. He told me that he'd read a couple of similar accounts, Footsteps, lights being switched on and off, furniture being thrown around violently. One family from Arizona in the US had supposedly got rid of a similar unwelcome housemate by simply confronting it. Several experts, and I use that term lightly, believed that poltergeists and other noisy ghosts behaved in such a way because they were confused and reacted violently to this disorientation. I was skeptical, but as my brother continued, it began to seem less ridiculous, and worth a try at least. Especially if it meant I didn't have to sleep on someone's floor for the next two years until I could sell the flat. He then told me that one of these experts believed that such disturbances occur when the spirit of someone who's passed doesn't realize it's dead when it wanders around a place which it used to call home. It sees objects, belongings, and so on, which are unfamiliar and simply cannot understand why. In this utter confusion, it lashes out, mostly at possessions, but occasionally at people who it sees as invaders of its home. One particular instance was reported in a family home. A bedroom would be thrown into disarray because it used to be the deceased's. By confronting the spirit while it was manifest, and telling it that it no longer lived there, and that it had passed on, the entity dissipated and moved on. It all seemed like mumbo-jumbo to me, but then so did the very idea of a ghost, and by this point I was convinced one was living or unliving in my flat. We agreed then that we would at least try to confront it. I have to say I was curious, but part of me wanted to just leave it all behind. My brother had the idea that we should clear the spare room out completely, and sleeping there each night until the footsteps appeared. It made sense, as that was a focal point for the disturbances, but the entire Weight filled me with apprehension. On the second night, 
it happened. There we were, sleeping on the floor like we did when we had sleepovers as kids, waiting in the spare room for something we didn't understand to appear. With everything removed, the room seemed bare, and I felt a strange sadness for the place, an emptiness. At around 1am, I first heard it. Somehow I knew it would appear that night. I felt it in the atmosphere like the tension before a storm. Click. The hall light came on. My brother looked at me with a mixture of fright and excitement. Silence. Then, the footsteps began. They walked slowly down the hall to my bedroom door, and there they waited, while we waited also in the place where my belongings had been bashed and broken over and over. Finally, they turned and began their slow, shuffling walk towards the spare room, where we now lay. By the time the footsteps reached the door, my brother and I were both on our feet. I've never been so scared, and I could hear the terror in my brother's shaking breath. Then, the handle turned slowly. The door opened. Nothing. There was nothing there. Just an empty doorway. My brother had taken out his phone and was recording video. But he couldn't see anything but thin air. I can't remember the exact words we used. But between the two of us, we hesitated, finally conveying that if anyone was there, they were dead, and that they no longer lived in the flat and needed to accept it and move on. Nothing. Again. We waited for a moment, and as I turned to my brother to smile and suggest that perhaps it had worked, the door slammed shut, and the light in the spare room went out utter darkness. I panicked, and I'm a little ashamed to say I screamed for help, the fear of being trapped welling up inside me. I could hear my brother fumbling around. He told me to be calm. I wasn't. He told me to look for the door. I couldn't find it. Disorientated by dark, as if the room had changed somehow. It felt smaller, cramped and stifled. Then, in the darkness, I heard it. My brother clearly did too, as he swore under his breath, asking if the sound was coming from me. My voice wavered and I simply said no. Behind us, in the gloom of that little room, we could hear breathing. The breaths were long, and somehow carried threat with them. And then, a horrible inhaled gasp, followed by the deafening scream of a man right behind me. Terror overcame me, and as I finally found the door, my brother knocked into me in the pitch black and headed out into the hallway, with me quickly behind. In the fevered escape, I lost my footing, and managed to fall onto my side, on the floor directly in front of the open door to the blackness of the spare room. The wind had been knocked out of me, but if I could have, I would have cried out in horror at what I saw. The light in the spare room flicked back on, revealing a figure standing in the room, facing the wall. It began to turn slowly. And as it did, I could see what I can only describe as a face. Its skin bloated and tinged with a bruised blue, and its hair oily and straggled. I kicked the door shut, and as my brother helped me to my feet, we ran out of the flat, only to hear the spare room door open behind us, and running footsteps heading once more into the kitchen. 
We did not look back. I haven't slept in the flat since then. In fact, I could only step foot into it to retrieve some of my things when accompanied by my brother and two of my friends during the day. I refuse to sleep there, and between my family and myself have managed to find the money needed to rent elsewhere while I wait to sell the place. It's further from work and the area isn't as nice, but I really don't care. After speaking to the couple who lived there before me, you might already suspect what they told me in way of an explanation. They too heard footsteps occasionally in the hall at night, but nothing else of consequence, and happily lived there with their young son for a few years. What they could tell me was that they had bought the flat from an estate agent and knew fine well the history, but not being superstitious, they knew they had a bargain on their hands if they ignored what had happened. The original owner had lived there by himself. By all accounts, he was a very private person, and so no one in the building knew him very well. One night, a terrible scream was heard from the man's flat. And believe me, it is his. When neighbors went to his door, he did not answer. And soon afterwards, the smell of gas filled the hallway inside. The emergency services were called and the building evacuated. When they entered the flat, they found the man's bedroom in disarray, his belongings torn and broken up. In the kitchen, they discovered his dead body, kneeling on the floor, half sticking out of the oven, his skin blue due to asphyxiation. I've thought about the entire events often wondered why the man's ghost still lingers there. I've wondered why he made his presence felt more strongly to me than those who lived there before me. Most of all, there is one question, for some unknown reason, which never seems to leave me. What made him scream in the first place? So a proper old school horror story there from the one and only Michael Whitehouse. I do so love reading his stories, I really do. How are you all doing out there? Oh, I see some of you are nodded off to sleep already. Well, that's just fine. Those of you who are still awake, pass around the cold drinks, everyone. We're here to have some fun. Keep warm around the fire and relax. Okay, what do we have next? Well, I think you're going to enjoy this one, boys and girls. You ready for another story? Okay, let's go. The Teddy Bear and the Room Nightmares. What do they mean? For years I've tried to figure out their meanings, from documenting my own to the true terror tales of people from all over the world. There was only one nightmare I was curious about, but in the searching for answers, I found only pain and loss. It happened in 1998 during my trip to Hamilton Lodge, a lavish cabin owned by my foster mother's grandparents. I was to spend a few weeks there with my foster mother and her sister, who was also bringing her daughter along to get away from the busy streets of the city. Out of respect for my adopted family, I referred to her as my cousin. The family weren't unusual in any way, but they could sometimes be unusual. They would have a habit of staring at any wall on the northern side of the lodge. I'd asked a number of times, but the only response I would get would be, Oh, it's nothing, just daydreaming. I'd like to think I got on with my foster mother's extended family, but in truth, I wouldn't usually speak to my foster mother's sister. She was what some would call quick to judge and quicker to brand. Oh boy, did she brand me. From the first day I came to live with my foster mother, she was at my throat. I did, however, get on surprisingly well with the niece of my foster mother. We'd spend most of the days doodling or chatting away, usually about our lives at the time, like what I was doing at middle school and my plans for high school. I told her of my aspersions of studying the human mind and what makes it tick, as well as my fascination with the paranormal. 
Well, the cousin enjoyed the paranormal, but only in horror stories she found online or she'd overheard at school. Well, she began to tell me of a story about how there was a hidden room in the attic of the lodge, one that had been locked by my foster grandmother. No one knows why it had been locked, but what was known was that it was a toy room, supposedly built for the grandmother and her imaginary friend. The imaginary friend was a teddy bear, fit to bursting and the size of a small person. Unfortunately, after a few nightmares involving the teddy bear consuming the grandmother, her parents had little to no choice but to lock the door and hide it. Well, I didn't believe any of the stories personally, although I did know that there was a room that had been locked in the attic. I had accidentally stumbled upon it after playing hide-and-seek with the cousin. I was frantically searching for a hiding place, but all there was was a large, old-fashioned wardrobe sat in the corner. Well, with little to no options, I hid in the wardrobe and slid myself to the back. I jumped as I pressed against the back and felt it slide away. Well, in my curiosity, I searched the newly exposed wall. To my surprise, it wasn't a wall, but in fact a door with a handle and keyhole. I jiggled the handle repeatedly, but to no avail. Upset and annoyed, I banged my fist hard into the door, but to my shock, the door banged back. A dull light emanated from the keyhole, and I found myself peering into the hole. Confused. I only saw glassy darkness, as if there was a mirror placed behind the door. Then a hand grabbed my shoulder and dragged me from inside the wardrobe, forcing me to scream. I'd been found by the cousin, who told me she heard me pounding on the door, and assumed I was hiding there. During the night, I decided to sleep on the floor in the cousin's room. Recently, we'd agreed to try a sleepover, and this was what the cousin had asked for after she'd recently had some unsettling nightmares. I shut my eyes and slowly drifted off into the dream world, craving for something pleasing to calm my curious mind. My eyes shot open, and I stood in the attic, my gaze directed at the wardrobe. Its double door closed, and yet a sense of danger was felt just behind them. A thunderous bang echoed through the attic, and the wardrobe doors began to violently shake until they were blasted open. An ominous light glared through the wardrobe door's frame, bathing the attic in a light that seemingly absorbed every other light source. I felt compelled, almost forced, to walk to the door. I couldn't control my legs or avert my eyes from the light. As I approached the open wardrobe, the door hidden behind gently glided open, and it was then I saw the room for the first time. The walls had a wallpaper that was a mix of light pink with thin white stripes, all equal distance apart. There were three lights designed to look like candles, one on each wall of the room. The room itself was tiny, almost miniature in design, as if it was built specifically for children and not to accommodate adults. In the centre of the room, taking up most of the space, was a four-poster queen-size bed, its poles connecting in the ceiling. A freshly made quilt looked lush and pampered, sharing the light pink colour of the walls. In the very centre of the bed was a magnificently groomed and prestige teddy bear that was almost as big as I was. From its red bow tie to its glassy black eyes, it had an aura of friendliness to it. Oh, I wanted to hug it, squeeze it, and never let it go, but I couldn't. The force in my mind had stopped me. It was its eyes. They looked exactly like the mirror I thought I'd seen through the keyhole. Uh, albeit fear or self-preservation, I began to walk backwards, away from the bed, and back into the wardrobe. And then, with an unrelenting force, the door slammed shut in my face. I woke with a start to find the blinding light of the cousin's torch glaring in my face. She told me I'd been shouting in my sleep about the attic and a teddy bear. I decided to explain the contents of my night terror to the cousin, which understandably unnerved her. The curiosity began to get the better of the cousin. Ultimately losing her battle to stay put, she began to tiptoe out of her room and towards the attic. The cousin ascended the ladder to the attic, followed shortly by me, and we stared directly at the wardrobe. The same sense of foreboding dread washed over me that I'd felt in my dream. The doors of the wardrobe creaked open by themselves, to reveal all the clothes had gone, and the door behind was revealed. 
unflinching, the cousin tried the door, but it was thankfully locked. Angrily, she hit the door and turned, but as she did, we heard the faintest of lock tumblers unlock. The door slowly creaked open, and the room was revealed to us. It matched almost perfectly to my dream, with every detail and item placement, almost to perfection. The cousin went stiff as a board as soon as she walked into the room. Her gaze had been transfixed on the teddy placed in the center of the bed. Before I could go to grab her, she'd scaled the bed and dove into a hugging position. And that was when it happened. The teddy bear's eyes blinked, and it gripped her with its human-like paws. Its sewn belly split apart to reveal an inner layer of intestinal-like tethers making up the shape of the bear. Before I knew what was going on, the cousin was sucked inside the teddy bear and its lining stitched itself up. I ran, screaming from the door, but found nothing but a wall where the door had once been. I couldn't contain my fear, and I began to cry as I felt the walls etch closer towards me. The entire time the teddy bear just sat and looked at me with a new smile growing across its mouth. The teddy bear began to shout, but no movements came from its mouth. Instead it came from inside the bear like a recorded voice of a child. Come and play with me. All I want is a hug. I sat up, screaming from the sleeping bag laid on the floor of the cousin's room, my body shaking and flushed with sweat. A thin strip of light blazed from the curtains. This left a perfect line down the cousin's empty bed. I stumbled out of the bedroom and into the hallway, my head dizzy, leaving the hallway spinning. I ran into the kitchen, shouting nonsensical sentences, hoping someone would listen, but I was surprised to see it was filled with police officers. My foster mother took me to one side and asked if I'd seen the cousin during the night. My answer was, the last time we were together, was last night, when we went into the attic. The blood drained from both my foster mother and her sister's faces, who now both ran to the attic. I showed the police officers where we'd been, and they moved the wardrobe. However, behind it was nothing but a solid wall. Furious, I began to bang on the wall, adamant that she was behind it, trapped in that hell of a room with a goddamn teddy bear. I was taken away by my foster mother, her eyes still filled with tears. Why did no one believe me? No one believed this. Unfortunately... This went on for years, through the therapy and sit-downs with my foster mother. And, well, it's been well over two decades since the so-called disappearance of my cousin. The police had closed the case and labelled it as a runaway case. It was never a fitting end, in my opinion, and it tormented me. As for the lodge, my foster mother's sister had it boarded up and left to rot. The memories there would only breed sadness and despair. On the anniversary of the cousin's disappearance, I decided to travel to the lodge one last time. But this time, I had a goal. I parked up my car in front of the once tranquil building, now fallen into disrepair and overgrowth. So many happy memories, so much hope, but also so many haunting dreams. I pulled open the trunk of my car and pulled out the fire axe I procured, and I stopped to look at the roof feeling of the teddy bear's eyes beating down on me gave me the wrong kind of inspiration. In an act of unwavering determination, I hacked my way through the barriers that had been placed over every door. My path of destruction was a reminder of the mercy I would give to what was waiting behind that attic door, and how it should get no better treatment. I stood facing the wall in the attic, my heart racing from the rampage through the house. With my axe at the ready, I began chopping the wall. With anger and rage fueling my movements, I didn't stop until I hit a sturdy door frame. Once I'd removed the remaining debris of the wall, I went about breaking down the door. It felt surprisingly tough for such an old door. Its wood was somewhat well preserved with no sign of age damage. Once the door finally gave way, I saw the room for the first time in two decades. Only now it was a far cry from the nightmare I'd remembered. The once pink and white walls that were perfectly plastered now had a grey and mouldy coating. 
one that came with water damage and age. The candle design lights hung from their positions, with the wires exposed and ghastly green gunk dripping from the holes where they'd once rested. The bed had also fared no better, as the once pink quilt was nothing more than a dust-covered rag, riddled with moth holes and rodent droppings. The only thing in the entire room that was perfectly kept was that same old teddy bear, still sat in the same position on the bed. Images of the night I'd lost the cousin ploughed into my mind, forcing me to drop the axe and clutch my head. I looked at the teddy bear, its face still mocking me, no, taunting me. I pulled out a knife from my coat and lunged onto the bed, driving deep into the teddy bear's belly. As I cut it open, an ungodly smell of bile and decomposing meat hit me full force. I looked to the open bear, and what I saw filled me with sadness, regret, and rage. Curled up in a fearing fetal position were the bones of my... my cousin. She must have been slowly digesting for years inside this bear, in this room, in this hell. I screamed in anger and swore bloody until my lungs gave out, and then I realized I was sat in a derelict room, shouting at an inanimate object. I turned to leave, but was stopped at a sound, something that sent a shiver across my entire body, in a low and hushed voice of something very old. The words, Come and play. All I want is a hug bounced around the room. I turned to see the bear begin to move from its spot, and its insides began writhing. Before I knew what was happening, I was tackled to the floor by the teddy bear, which felt as heavy as a full-grown person. I threw the bear off me and scrambled onto the bed. An ominous sound of cracking bones and splitting fabric ripped through the empty lodge, stirring the local wildlife. Slowly the bear stood up straight, casting a deathly shadow from the moonlight that crept through a hole in the roof. I stood shocked as the bear's once cuddly exterior began to warp and malform. The fur began to molt, and the face took on a more animalistic appearance. Long, thick claws began to protrude from its hand-like paws. All the while the same writhing movements were seen all over its body. With an ear-shattering shriek, the teddy lunged at me and sank its sharpened fangs deep into my arm. With force, I shook free of its bite, but now I was bleeding badly. I ran for the door, but was tripped over by something. Twisting, I saw the teddy bear had latched multiple writhing tendrils from its belly that were dragging me backwards. I desperately reached in any direction in hopes of grabbing something to stop me, and that's when I felt a wooden handle. Without thinking, I grabbed the fire axe and severed the tendrils from my legs. They writhed for a few moments before they went dead, and this opened my attention back to the teddy bear. In a moment of rage, I swung the axe and lodged it into the teddy's neck, and an ungodly amount of foul-smelling blackened pus rained onto me as a sickening shriek from the teddy bear echoed all round. With a satisfying thud, the teddy bear fell to the ground limp, and the lodge fell into a somber silence. It was over. The nightmarish demon that had haunted me was finally gone. I couldn't help but crack a smile as I stared at the now dead teddy bear. For everything I'd just done, I also felt an overwhelming sense of sadness wash over me. Still sat in the stomach of the teddy bear was my cousin, cradled in her fearing fetal position. I took a skeleton out of the teddy's carcass and brought it outside. After what she must have gone through, she should have a proper burial. I took out a can of kerosene I brought and began dousing the room with a liquid, ensuring I covered the teddy bear especially well. Then I lit a match and threw it onto the bed, allowing myself to finally feel happy. Watching the flames erupt to the roof, releasing a feeling of satisfaction deep inside me. And I left the lodge to burn. Lord knows, it should have been done long before I'd stayed there. 
I never had another dream of the room, or of the bear, but from time to time, when I walk around my house's attic, I swear I can hear the faint voice of my cousin behind the walls beckoning me. Come and play with me. All I want is a hug. When you were young and growing up, I bet there was that one creepy old place in your neighborhood that scared the living death out of all the local children. Some old abandoned house or other such place. The kind of place about which rumors abound and where no young person dare set foot. You're thinking about that place right now, aren't you? We all have that one story, don't we? The one you grow up thinking about, but never actually have the balls to tell anyone. Well, this is my story. I don't know what I'm hoping to accomplish by telling you. Maybe I'm looking for someone to tell me that I'm not insane. Or maybe once I say it out loud, it will... <laughs> I don't know. Just someone listen to this. Just please. Now, let me give you a little background. Twenty years ago, when I was eight years old, and still living with my mum, my friend Dave and I decided that we would brave the house. Now, the house was an abandoned two-story home that had been empty going on ten years, save for the occasional drug abuser that would sleep there. However, that's not what made this particular house special. The standing rumor is what made it really interesting. For as long as I can remember, adults in my neighborhood had told us, the children, that it was haunted. I'm sure it was just their way of getting us not to play in it, though. Nevertheless, because of that, the house had a sort of ominous aura that hung around it. Just looking at that decaying building would give you the shivers. Although, despite our inherent fear of the place, Dave and I decided we would explore this house. We would become <laughs> legends in our own right. At least, that's what we hoped. It was a Tuesday all those years ago, and well past midnight, and both of our parents had fallen asleep. The two of us decided we would sneak out, <laughs> you know, use the night as our cover. We agreed it would be best to meet up in front of the house. Still, I wish we hadn't agreed to do it. There I was alone, waiting in front of the house for my friend. I couldn't help but feel small when I looked at it. It might have been old, and the wood may have been rotting, but man, did it look enormous. I bet even adults felt dwarfed by it. To keep myself from chickening out, I decided to think about something else while I waited. It was a little cold that night, which was the typical weather after hard rain. Ah, oh, crap, I muttered, noticing the mud that covered my shoes. I should have paid more attention to where I was stepping. Mom is going to kill me when she... My voice trailed off when I heard a dull thud from behind me. It sounded like someone knocked a door. Was... Was it the house? Or was I just imagining things? I spun around expecting to see a hairy monster behind me. 
Instead, it was just the house. Broken windows, splintered wood, and a roof that had more than a few holes in it. Just the usual, nothing to panic about. I should have been relieved, but I found myself slightly shaken. Soon I would be stepping into one of the most feared places in our neighborhood. I wasn't even inside yet, and I could already feel the slight tremor in my hand. Before I could reconsider the mission, Dave arrived. I quickly stuffed my hands into my pockets to hide the quiver. <laughs> I could see a small figure bouncing up and down the little jokester was skipping across the street. My fears were immediately replaced with giddy laughter. <laughs> you are such a clown, I managed to say in between my giggles. We both reached out and shook hands, like his father had taught us. Luckily, he didn't notice the tremor. Dave used his hands to smooth back his black hair kind of like a greaser would in a cliched movie. You ready for this? He nodded towards the door. Typical Dave. He always tried to look cool. Whether it was riding his bike with no hands or sneaking into an abandoned house, he never failed to give off the I'm a badass vibe. I tried my best to sound nonchalant. Only if you are, Davey. The comment awarded me a slight snicker. Dave hated it when I called him Davy. He said it sounded girly. <laughs> and that's exactly why I used it. Rather than shoot a retort at me, he simply nudged me towards the house. And we began walking to the door. Our small feet made quiet echoes in the streets. I was worried it might wake someone. If we had any doubts about what we were doing, that moment would have been the right time to bail out. Of course, as per the norm, stupidity got the better of us. The second our feet hit the old steps, we knew there would be no turning back. <laughs> Think we should knock? Dave joked. Seeing him act all cool somehow gave me courage. And so, I knocked. What I heard made the hair on my neck stand to attention. The same thud I'd heard from earlier reverberated through the door when my knuckles landed. I gulped loudly but maintained an overall calm composure. The two of us breathed in deeply, turned the doorknob, and pushed the door open. We received a long, drawn-out creak as payment. I thought I was going to pee my pants, and Davy looked like he was about to shit a brick. <laughs> Somehow we managed to keep our undies clean. It was dark. I mean, real dark. Neither one of us had brought a flashlight. We didn't want to accidentally wake up a neighbor by shining a light into their house. Given the circumstances, we decided it was best to use moonlight. Our eyes were met with a dimly lit house. It took a minute to adjust to. The house was littered with trash, covered in graffiti, and was seemingly falling apart all over. And yet, it didn't seem as frightening as we were led to believe. Sure, the darkness made it look spooky, but as I looked at the cracked marble floor, I couldn't help but be reminded of my house. Huh, <laughs> this isn't so bad. Yes, it was me who broke the silence. Do you think the ghost will be pissed that we tracked the mud in the house? 
Dave laughed and pointed at the floor. Little footprints followed us all over the house. <laughs> Remind me to clean my shoes before I go back home. I giggled at the thought. Here we are in the big spooky house, cracking jokes about muddy shoes. <sighs> it was all fun and games. After familiarizing ourselves with the first floor, which consisted of an empty living room, a kitchen with rotted food in the cupboards, a bathroom with a disgusting toilet, and a curious looking locked door, we decided to explore the second floor. We ascended the stairs together, Dave leading with his brave face on. The wooden stairs were old, much like the rest of the house, and each step left us wondering if it would collapse beneath us. Think the ghost is up there? I asked, half sincere. Dave chuckled at the question. <laughs> Ghosts probably aren't even real. We'd reached the end of the stairs and were on the top floor. It wasn't a big second story. Two hallways, one to the right and one to the left. Four rooms for the two of us to explore. Let's go left, Dave suggested. So we went left and into the first door. The door was already open, so we just peeked our heads in. The first thing I noticed was the hole in the roof. Moonlight was shining through it, and it gave us a faint light to survey the room with. It wasn't a very nice room. Actually, it was kind of like my room. Probably big enough to have a bed, and dresser, maybe a desk could fit in too. We couldn't see inside the closet, though. The light didn't quite reach it. Dave looked at me, and I looked at him. I bet there's something cool in there. Let's go look, Dave suggested with a mischievous smile. Not sure what we were hoping for exactly. A treasure in a closet or something. Just before I stepped into the room, I heard the familiar thud noise. The one that was made before, and when, I knocked on the door. My heart felt like it was going to stop. The noise was distant, but there was no mistaking it. My first instinct was to run, but I couldn't leave Dave behind. <laughs> He, of course, paid no mind to it. Hell, he was already in the room walking towards the closet. And it was at that moment that things went to hell. I never even had the chance to warn him. The second Dave stepped into the center of the room, there was a frightening crack. He didn't have time to react. The wood splintered, the ground beneath him gave way, and he fell through the floor. I nearly jumped out of my skin. Everything in front of me was crashing down. The wood was so old and decayed that it couldn't even support Davy. Dust and dirt flew everywhere. By the time it was over, it was hard to breathe. Wait, Dave didn't make a sound. Did he die on impact? Was he okay? My mind had never raced so fast. Dave! <coughs> Dave! I shouted in between coughs. Dave! Are you okay? I repeated the question a few more times and waited. After an agonizing minute, I got my response. I'm okay, he answered weakly. Not a scratch on me. I peered down the large hole that was now in front of me. Dust was everywhere, 
but as it cleared I could see him more clearly. There was Dave, <laughs> and he was completely intact. <laughs> and guess where I am? I sighed deeply, glad that he hadn't lost his sense of adventure. I'm in the locked room. Get down here. I'll open the door for you. He wiped the dirt off his forehead and motioned for me to come down. I obediently turned around and headed for the stairs, preferring to take the safe route down. As I reached the bottom of the stairs, I noticed something odd. Were those big footprints always there? Two frighteningly large footprints had been left on the floor. And there was something odd about them, though. They didn't look human. Too big. Four toes. And they were round. My imagination quickly got the better of me, and I could feel the panic rising quickly. I was starting to feel nauseous. Even more so when I realized the footsteps were leading to the room that Dave was in. I glanced at the front door. It was open. I could leave right now. Run home and tell my parents to call the police. We didn't have cell phones back then. But I didn't do any of that. I just kept walking towards the locked room. The door was open, and I could see shadows dancing on the door frame. There were two shadows, one big and one small. The larger shadow was pounding into the smaller one. I could hear the blows landing. Thump, 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 thump. Each time it hit, Dave would whimper. I was frozen in place. The door was only a few feet away, but I couldn't bring myself to take another step. I wanted to save my friend, but I just couldn't move. I could only stand there and watch the shadows. Please, stop! Smash! The last hit was harder than any of the other ones. I could hear the bones break from where I was standing. Dave's shadow stopped moving. The larger shadow picked up the frail little body and began slashing into it with what looked like a blade. A dark liquid splashed onto the door and started oozing towards the floor. I wanted to puke. I could feel hot liquid running down my pants. I must have been scared enough to piss myself. I looked at the floor and saw the puddle that I'd made. Oh, it was time to leave. I took one last glance at the door, and what I saw when I looked up still haunts me today. A large humanoid figure stood in the doorway, holding Dave's body. It was too dark to see it clearly, but I got a peek at its eyes. Its big, blue eyes. Big and blue like the ocean, and the waves were rippling with rage. I wanted to leave. No, I needed to leave but my legs refused to move. They were anchored to the floor. Fear had stopped them completely. My heart, on the other hand, was moving. It was moving very fast. Reluctantly, I stood there, staring at the monster that was holding my dead friend. It didn't take long for our eyes to meet. We stood there in an eternal staring contest. I was too afraid to blink. I remember thinking that if I closed my eyes, I would never open them again. 
It was only after two long minutes that I could finally feel my legs again. So I slowly took a step back. The monster mimicked my movements by stepping forward each time I took a step back. My heart sunk when I realized what it was doing. Every molecule in my body was telling me to turn around and sprint. But could I really outrun this monstrosity? No. There was no way. I decided to keep my pace. Buy myself time until I got to the door. Once we reached the living room, it dropped Dave, outstretched its arms towards me, and grinned. It was the single most wicked thing I'd experienced in my life. The monster's grin, from corner to corner, reached both of its eyes. His teeth were long and white like a shark. We were almost at the door, but he was no longer mimicking my steps. For each step I took, he took two. Step by step, he was closing the gap. The moonlight from the window shined on his outstretched arm. Its hand was human-like, only there was something off about it. The nails were long, the skin was rotted, and some of the flesh looked like it had been scratched off. It was enough to make me dizzy. Soon, I could hear it breathing. Each breath was labored, it was almost wheezing. One more step and I would see its entire body in the moonlight. I didn't want that. That thought alone was enough to make me turn, grab the doorknob, throw it open, and rush out of the house. I didn't dare look over my shoulder until there was some distance between the two of us. I expected to turn around and see the monster lumbering after me, but, surprisingly, it wasn't. The monster never came out of the house. It didn't chase me down the street. It didn't rip me to pieces. It just stood there, on the porch, waving goodbye. Its malformed hand slowly rocking back and forth, with the same deranged smile on its face. A few days later, when the police report was made public, my parents told me that the monster was just a hobo on drugs. The police had found Dave's body next to a dead homeless man. Apparently he'd overdosed shortly after I'd left. I tried to tell myself that I was just imagining things and that there was no monster. But I don't know what to believe. I've been thinking about it a lot lately. I can't get that fucking smile out of my head. <sighs> I'm done with this. If I say any more, I'll start having nightmares again. Ah, oh, food's here anyway. I just heard a knock at the door. Everyone still okay out there? Oh, I see most of you are getting really comfortable now. Some of you have nodded off in the back there. That's okay by me. Your sweet dreams and everything that goes with them. For those of you who are still awake, I've got another weird and wonderful story coming up for you right now. Are you ready? Okay, let's do this. People like to make fun of me because one of my hands is slightly smaller than the other. Hmm, they probably wouldn't laugh if they knew the story behind it. You see, back in grade school we used to hide out in this dark corner under the stairs at lunch and share horror stories. 
it was the perfect spot because it was naturally kind of spooky and because it was out of sight from our teachers and hall monitors who banned everything we ever liked, horror stories included. There was this one tale that Kevin Farland, or Fartland as we called him, liked to tell the new kids the story of Baxter Baby Hands. I'll never forget the first time I heard it, because I started laughing and Fartland punched me in the face. <sighs> Good times. As Fartland's story goes, there was once an orphan named Baxter who worked in a factory town in the olden days. Back then, it wasn't uncommon for factories to employ kids to fix their machines whenever they got jammed, because they were smaller and could fit through the gears. Baxter had the smallest and most nimble hands out of all the kids working at this factory. So small, in fact, they called him Baxter Baby Hands. He was the one they always called on to fix the big grinder near the back. One day, the foreman asked him to go pluck out a rock caught in the grinder's gears. Problem was, he'd forgotten to turn off the machine. So, little Baxter walked over to this big machine, reached inside, and yanked out the rock. As soon as he did, the gear started turning again, and Baxter's hands got crushed. They say his scream could be heard two towns over. Baxter survived, but his hands were gone forever. He was just a poor orphan kid, so the doctors didn't bother doing anything beyond patching him up. And, of course, without hands, he couldn't work anymore. Back then, if you didn't work, you were useless. They say Baxter starved to death holding out his mangled stumps like a homeless person begging for food. But any money anyone might have thrown his way slipped between the fingers he no longer had. A few days passed, and then, one night, the factory foreman woke up to something small and soft against his cheeks. At first he thought it was his wife's hand, but as it came in for another stroke, he realized it was much much smaller, about the size of a baby hand. He opened his eyes and saw Baxter leaning over him, with itty-bitty hands growing out of his stumps. His wife found the foreman the next day, dead, with both hands cut off. Over the course of the next fifteen years, every single person adult and child, who had been working at the factory the day Baxter lost his hands, wound up dead with their own hands missing. The townsfolk, worried they'd be next, ordered his pauper's grave to be dug up and his body to be burned. When they opened his grave, however, they got more than they'd bargained for. Inside was the rotting corpse of Baxter, with the foreman's hands sewn to his stumps, and all the hands he'd collected sewn to each of the fingers. They'd shriveled up like shrunken heads, looking almost as small as baby hands. Horrified, the townsfolk burned Baxter and his baby hands then and there, hoping to end the curse. And that's how his legend began. Baxter, baby hands. Some say one of the villagers took one of his baby hands as a souvenir before they burned him. So part of Baxter is still out there to this day. And if you whisper Baxter baby hands name in the mirror three times before going to bed, he'll appear and touch you with his ten tiny hands. If he likes how your skin feels, he'll rip off one of your hands and add it to his collection. Fartland looked dead serious every time he told this story. Over the years, he'd even add to it and embellish it, saying his uncle had tried to summon Baxter Baby Hands, and his great-great-great-grandfather was the foreman. 
I never believed this story myself. Not until I tried to prove them all wrong by summoning Baxter baby hands myself. I asked a friend to be a witness and recited Baxter baby hands name three times in his mirror before walking back home and going to bed. I never in a million years expected anything would come of it. I'd played Ouija and tried the Bloody Mary thing many times without seeing anything weird. I was convinced nothing would happen. I was wrong. I don't know at what time of night it happened, but I know I was in a pretty deep sleep when I felt something on my face. It wasn't enough to wake me up with a start, but it did stir me out of my slumber. It was a light, soft touch against my cheeks. I thought it was a curtain swaying in the breeze, so I ignored it at first and turned over. The gentle touch followed me across the bed, and that's when I became concerned. I tried to open my eyes, but as soon as I did, I felt tiny somethings hold my eyelids down by force. Next, I tried to scream, but the same thing happened to my lips. Whatever was touching me slowly ran up and down my cheeks in gentle, yet violating facial caresses. It spread from my cheeks to my forehead and chin going from soft strokes to firm kneading, like a cat's paws, except without the claws. I was paralyzed with fear, barely able to breathe as it happened. I couldn't call for my parents. Hell, I couldn't even see what was happening to me. I don't think I'll ever be that scared again in my life. The kneading of my face continued for at least ten minutes as though it was being assessed, but I'm not sure to what end. Then, the pressure on my eyelids let up, and I was able to open them. What I saw, then, defied all logic. There were blurry fingers everywhere and going in every direction. As they pulled away from my face, they came into focus, and the millions of little fingers became about 50. They were tiny fingers on tiny baby hands. Baxter's baby hands. Each little hand was growing out of its own adult finger that wiggled and bowed like those of a puppeteer. One finger remained downcast, the baby hand at its end holding my mouth shut. Every digit, small and large alike, seemed to move of its own volition, yet it were all tied to a single source controlling them. That source was a man standing behind the veil of fingers. He was short for his age, and wore rags that looked three times too small. They were stretched out as though he'd slowly grown out of them, but never bothered changing into something better suited for him. As for his face, I honestly don't remember it. My eyes were too busy looking at the hypnotic mess of his many hands. It was hard to focus on anything else. Baxter smiled and pulled his right hand closer to his face. All six of the index fingers on it rose up to shush me as he released my mouth. I didn't know what to think, but I knew better than to scream. Something told me it would be worse if I screamed. He then reached for his left hand and plucked out one of his baby hands. It came off with an innocent pop. No blood, no resistance. Like a carrot coming out of the soil. His right hand, or rather hands, gripped my left one tightly. They pulled at it so hard that I started crying soundlessly. The pressure was immense, like being the rope in a tug of war. Suddenly, I heard a pop, and I lost all feeling in that hand. I didn't want to look down, but my eyes did it on their own. My left hand was gone, 
and in its place was just a smooth, bloodless stump. I tried to scream, but a pair of baby hands quickly pushed my lips together until I could only groan. I then watched as Baxter pressed his severed baby hand against my bloodless stump, and I felt a prick as the small veins on it reached into my skin and connected with mine. I could feel the baby hand, and within minutes I could even wiggle its fingers. The sensation was beyond bizarre. I knew it wasn't mine, it felt different but I had control over it. Baxter baby hands then put my left hand where he'd removed his own. It attached and deflated to the size of a baby hand. Without a single word he turned around and walked out of my bedroom door. I was beyond horrified. I just sat there in shock and watched the tiny baby hand at the foot of my wrist. It started to grow as I watched it. Within hours, it was almost the size of my normal hand, but it never quite made it all the way. Now, people make fun of me for my little hand. They say I'm a freak. I mean, if you didn't know it, you probably wouldn't even notice. But if I put my hands together, you can tell my fingers are half an inch too short. And my hand isn't quite as wide. I know, somewhere out there, Baxter Baby Hand still has it. And I know people are still stupid enough to try summoning him. Want to know how I know? Well, sometimes late at night, I can feel my fingertips gently caressing someone's face. But my hands are both next to me, holding my pillow. Ah, the sound of the crackling fire. It really is very seductive, isn't it? Hope these stories are helping you relax and get ready for your night's sleep. Well, see most of you are still with me. A few of you drifted off, that's okay. One more short story to send you off to the land of the wonderful sleep. Ready? Okay, let's do this. I was so excited for this day. Our school was having a picnic, which it really knew how to do. The picnic was going to be in a large forest about 40 miles from our school. Our school likes to plan far away trips. Whenever I'm going on a vacation or trip, I like to find out every single fact about it. It turns out this forest's history dates back four or five hundred years. It was inhabited by a Native American tribe who was known for its worship of evil spirits. When the settlers came in, the natives did not take kindly to them. When the diseases brought in by the settlers killed many of the tribe's people, they cursed the forest and the settlers. The next day, the tribe was gone, and all of the settlers were either dead or missing. The one that survived lived for another week before committing suicide. The story goes on to tell of loggers who came in about a hundred years later, and all died in mysterious accidents and murders. I'm not superstitious. I didn't believe in any of these curses. That morning, when I woke up, I went into the kitchen as usual and had my cereal. At about 6.30, my mum came and told me that the picnic was cancelled. The bus that was taking us there was having engine trouble. I asked her if she found that weird, and she said, ah, oh, it happens all the time. I thought about it, but brushed it off. My mother came back to inform me that they found a replacement bus at the last minute. I was overjoyed. We could finally go and have some time, doing something other than math problems and English homework. The bus finally showed up and I got on. For some reason, 
They had the freshmen and seniors on the same trip. The seniors were almost evil. There were rumors of freshman faces being shoved in toilets and urinals, and freshmen being locked in car trunks for as many as two or three days. I was worried about this. About twenty miles into the ride, our bus got a flat tire. We found that the bus had a spare underneath, so the senior sent me to retrieve it. As I grabbed the tire and got out, I saw something out of my peripheral vision. A man standing about a quarter of a mile away. He seemed to be motioning to go back. I focused on him, but then he vanished into the mist. We replaced the tire and continued driving. We finally got there and talked to the woman at the visitor center. She handed us each a brochure on the history of the park. Oddly enough, it never once mentioned the old tribes of Indians, loggers or settlers. It just said that its history spanned from about 50 years ago to the present. We got out and set up the picnic. I hung around my usual friends and we did everything in our power to avoid the seniors. The picnics were okay. They provide time away from school, so we all liked them. After it was finished, we were informed the bus broke down again, and in the morning a few mechanics would come and fix it. That meant we would be spending the night on the bus. That worried me. There is no way those seniors would pass up an opportunity to prank us. So, as night fell, my group would keep two people on watch, and we would rotate every hour and a half. Of course, the first two fell asleep within the first two minutes. Here we were, in a haunted forest, with seniors ready to scare us. I woke up and checked my watch. 2.30. A note on my chest read, Have fun, seniors. I was extremely angry. But my anger turned to fear. There was something about this forest. The tall, leafless trees. The dark, foggy distance. The wind. My God, the wind. I kept hearing it as though it was saying, Be afraid. I kept hearing it. It wouldn't leave my head. Shut up, I screamed. Who are you? I kept seeing movement from the corner of my eye. I ran. I didn't know which way I was going, but I didn't care. Then, in the distance, there stood a tall, thick, unmoving figure. It was all black except for the eyes. The eyes. They were an ominous blood red. It moved. It walked in an odd, disturbing strut. I ran. I could see its shadow. The trees swayed with the wind as if they were alive. I tripped. It was gone. I saw an unlit, small cottage in the distance. I had no choice. I ran towards it and took shelter in it. Was I going insane? Or did I really see that creature? I was in a small room. The cottage looked old. Its floorboards creaked and its doors squeaked. It was horrible. Then I heard a deep, heavy breathing outside the window. And the window began to rattle. After thirty seconds, it stopped. I decided I would wait out the night here and travel back in the morning. But then I heard a pounding on the door. I couldn't stay in here any longer. I dove out of the window and cut myself on some of the glass. I ran for some time until I looked behind me. The creature was there again, moving faster. I ran until I found where the bus was supposed to be, but it wasn't there. Neither was the visitor center. I sat down, and I felt a cold breath on my neck. 
Then a hand on my shoulder. I closed my eyes and began praying. So a weird and wonderful collection of stories for you this evening. Hope you enjoyed those. Are you still awake? That really is a stupid question, isn't it? Because if you weren't, then you wouldn't be able to answer me anyway. Okay. I love doing these for you. Hope you enjoyed as much as I do. Very nice, relaxing way to spend a Friday evening after a long day and a long week doing whatever it is you've been doing. You can spend the last few hours of it with me, relaxing, getting ready for sleep. Sound good? Okay, good then. Well, we'll do this again very soon in that case. But for now, that's all for me. So very, very sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. It really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.